self-defense means meeting violence with violence. We'll cover the principles utilized to gain explosive hitting power. These are knockout strikes. They're designed to drop someone in his tracks. The arm portion covers handgun combat shooting as well as knife fighting. I'm going to train you the proper way of firing a handgun, which is point shooting. Tiger move. This is an excellent system for building the body, to keep it strong, to build the muscles, to keep you healthy. First a warrior, or all else is folly. McSweeney's self-defense system is designed for police and security professionals as well as the ordinary citizen. Self-defense means meeting violence with violence. So from a legal and moral point of view, the amount of violence you use in self-defense should be proportionate to the threat. For this reason, this videotape covers unarmed as well as armed self-defense. The unarmed portion covers powerful strikes which are designed to drop an aggressor instantly. The armed portion covers handgun combat shooting as well as knife fighting. You will also learn an exercise system known as Tiger Moves which build a strong healthy body using internal resistance. It consists of stretching with great tension and imitates the stretching exercises of animals. Let's begin with unarmed self-defense and study the power strikes of combat karate. This is a course in the power strikes of combat karate. We'll cover the principles utilized to gain explosive hitting power. What are some of these strikes? They're the leopard palm strike with the base of the palm hitting the skull in a circle. You can do it wide or short. Be a chop. The hand chambered back so there's no give, hitting the Adam's apple. A circle for power. Upswing to the jaw. We get a full 360, that gives us great speed, knockout power. Heart stop punch, side fist, not turned. It's like a ramrod, in and out to the sternum. These are some of the strikes we'll cover. What is combat karate? How does it differ from sport karate? Combat karate is oriented strictly towards self-defense. Sport karate is oriented towards tournament competition. People practice kata, which are a combination of many movements resembling a ballet-like dance. They perfect their kata, those movements, to win trophies in competition or they work on freestyle sparring, kumite, semi-contact, where they pull the blows. They're trying to score points, again, to win trophies, to become champions. So all their training is geared towards sport. Our training is geared strictly towards self-defense. Now these strikes, once mastered, will stop any aggressor, any attacker, regardless of his size. They're geared to stop, to immobilize. So we're not interested in the sport aspect of karate, 
follow me on this tape and in this course and you'll learn the principles of explosive hitting. Now we start with the stances. We use a few stances. One would be a fighting stance which resembles a boxer stance. The feet straddle either side of an imaginary line for balance. Knees are bent. The body is relaxed. We put the hands up, left and right, close to the face. This way they can block. So this is our fighting stance, our basic fighting stance. We can punch, we can block with the hands in this position. It's not like the traditional karate stance where this hand is extended, the right arm is chambered. This hand can't block, it has to come up to block. It can't punch, it's fully extended. This hand can't block, it has to come up to block and it telegraphs its intention to punch by its positioning. So this is not useful in street fighting. Street fighting, you use a boxer's stance. Chin is protected by the shoulder, elbows in to protect the chest, the hands protect the face, and you're ready to fight. Another stance we use is the horse stance. It's called that because it resembles riding a horse. The feet wide apart, knees bent, back straight. There are uses for this, such as chops to the side. So this has its uses in combat karate. Another stance would be the bow and arrow stance, where from the horse, we simply pivot and lean forward. The chest, the body center, notice, has moved from here to there. The movement of the body center is essential in gaining power. So the bow and arrow stance has its uses, as you'll see as we go through these strikes. Now we have two basic blocks. They come from a windmill. This is an inward windmill. And from this inward windmill, we get blocks. Someone punching at us, blocking. Someone kicking at us, we block. From this circle, we cover half of the body. From here, all the way to here. From the outward windmill, the outward circle, we have such blocks as a block against a club or a hook. Or again, we could block coming down this way against a kick with the inward. If you notice, these two windmill motions, outward windmill, inward windmill, cover the full range of protection. If a club attack comes, I swing out. Now, traditional karate teaches you to block with the palm in, in a fist or open hand. Usually it's a fist. The palm is in. You notice you can only traverse 180 degrees. You can't go any further. It looks strong, but it's a very weak block. By simply turning the fist so it's forward with open fingers or fist, we now can get a 360 circle. The ability to cover 360 means we can get speed. So these blocks, although they look soft, are actually very powerful, much more powerful than these blocks. So we teach you outward blocks and inward blocks. Incidentally, I believe that these two movements, the inward windmill and the outward windmill, are the primary moves of karate, thousands of years old. Because from these moves come all the strikes. For instance, from the inward windmill comes the leopard palm, hitting on the skull with this strike. From the outward windmill comes the chop. So we're going to cover now the various strikes, occasions when we use these strikes, the secrets of developing power in these strikes. What you've just seen could happen to anybody. You'll see more scenes like this during the video. They demonstrate real life situations in which you use the strikes to defend yourself. Let's take a look at the scene again.
The national press recently covered a story of a young lady who was mugged and raped. What made the story of great interest was that the lady had a black belt in karate. So most people figured, how did this happen? How could somebody train so much in karate to have a black belt that they could be mugged and raped so easily by one attacker? And the lady said that she simply froze when she attacked. She didn't know what to do. And that's typical of many people whose training is strictly in sport karate. They're great at performing kata in tournaments. They're great at semi-contact sparring for points to win trophies to become champions. They're not trained for spontaneous reaction to an attack. And that's what you need. You need two key things in combat karate. Spontaneous reaction. And you get spontaneous reaction from drill and drill and more drill in the basic strikes. Over and over and over and over. And hitting, hitting. And we do these in lines and we do these against heavy bags. And we drill constantly to develop spontaneous reaction. In addition, you have to develop knockout power to vital points. As we go through the strikes, we're going to show you the vital points. Some of them would be the Adam's apple, base of the nose, eye socket the pubic bones. You must develop knockout power to these vital points. Now the first technique we're going to work on is the heel palm. Now let me explain what we hit with. It's the base of the palm right here. You don't hit high with his give. You hit with the base of the palm and it's a natural weapon which is very strong. You don't have to develop it. You hit coming forth straight like a pile driver. It's like a cobra snake, in and out. Now the, the hand can be chambered high and you hit, or it can be low and you hit. The angle can be straight or coming up. It's important though that you have a straight line from the weapon itself, which is the meaty section at the base of the palm and that heavy bone there, right through the forearm, right into the shoulder. You want as much as possible a straight line. Don't wing it out with a bent elbow. Have that line relatively straight. Now, to practice this, chamber the hand back and move back and forth with the strike. Now do it with speed. Now I'm going to show you how we'd use this in an attack with a club. Paul will come on and show me now his Paul with a club in his hand. And uh, you can get a little closer, Paul. Now he's going to simulate, and we're going to do this in slow motion. He's going to simulate an attack on my head with that club. I block with that outward windmill block. Then I strike to the base of his nose. If the head is turned, I take the eye socket. That's another key target, the eye socket. That's a knockout point. If you strike that eye socket, you'll bounce the eyeball in against the optic nerve. It knocks out. If you hit the base of the nose, that's another knockout point, right into the brain. If the chin were up, you hit the chin. That could break the neck. But again, it's a knockout point. And notice there's no give when you hit with this. Thank you very much, Paul. When you hit with the base of the palm, there's absolutely no give. When you hit with the fist, the fist moves on two axes, up and down, side to side. So if you're not aligned perfectly and hit with perfect sidewards and upwards alignment, you could sprain the wrist and you're going to lose some of the force in the blow. You might even hit with these fingers, the bones here will break easily. When you hit with a fist, you have to have it aligned so you hit with the knuckles. But there's no chance of any give when you hit with this weapon. That's why it's a very powerful weapon. <clears throat> it can be combined from that outward windmill, which has speed and power, with the strike. And of course, you can add a knee shot. But we'll cover the knee a little later. Now that's the heel palm. You've just learned the heel palm shot. Now let's watch it in action. Here's the block, and here's the heel palm right behind it. The other strike in this scene is the knee shot. The knee is the body's most powerful, natural weapon. Let's learn how to use it. The next power strike is the jumping knee. Now, we can use knee strikes to various targets like the testicles, all right? But this is a different kind of a strike. The jumping knee uses the entire body weight moving forward rapidly to de deliver tremendous impact. I'll show you with Paul. As Paul comes here, he's going to hold this 
hitting bag here we have. It's an air bag, all right? All I'm going to do is step back to here. Now in slow motion, I simply jump off and hit with the knee. All right, we'll speed it up a bit. It's like that. We'll do it once more to give you an idea of it. In other words, I jump off in slow motion onto the left foot, chamber the knee, and then drive the knee straight into the target, which is the pubic bones, all right? It's not the groin, it's the pubic bones right here. A very weak target. So what I do is I jump off, chamber, and smash in, and my body weight is moving forward at the same time. So we'll speed it up a bit from here. He's there, I jump in and hit. As you can see, there's a lot of force. Thank you, Paul. Now, when you use that shot, you're trying to hit the pubic bones. They come together and form a joint at the pubis. It's part of the pelvic girdle, all right? The pubic bone is very weak. The juncture is very weak. It'll break just like an eggshell if you hit it with the knee. Now, I told you earlier that the knee is the body's most powerful natural weapon because it's heavy. It's a big, heavy weapon. The elbow is big and heavy, but the knee is bigger. It's the strongest weapon in the body. So you drive that heavy bone, and you hit the pubic bones, you'll break it. If you miss, the bladder is right behind. You can rupture the bladder with that shot. This shot will drop people. A shot into the groin, into the testicles is very difficult, unless the target is like that. People like this, you won't hit them, but you can hit straight into the pubic bone. So I'll show you with Paul again in slow motion. If Paul were to come at me like a, a wrestler, here's how I'd use this shot. Let's say he's up there like that as a wrestler. All I do is from here, I jump in on him and smash the bone in there. Okay, now, another thing, if Paul were in a boxing stance, let's say his left foot forward like a boxer, I'll show you another knee shot. This is a looping knee hooking in to his thigh bone. From here, maybe I'm even hit, I'm leaning down on him. The knee is already chambered. I'm in a boxing stance. I come in and I hit like that. It's a circle. I go out, around, and in. Whoo, like that. Tremendous kick. This is a Thai boxing knee shot. This will buckle the leg. The person will drop. You can use hand work after this. But this is enough to break the thigh bone. From here, you just come in, wham, like that. Thank you, Paul. So the jumping knee then, you jump forward to get the body weight going. The whole body is in movement. You wouldn't, you wouldn't do this against a boxer. You'll be hit on the way in. You do this against a grappler who doesn't expect to be hit here in the pubic bones. You jump in and smash that knee forward like that. The other knee shot is a hooking knee shot like that, in which we're hitting the pubic bones or the bladder. That's the jumping knee shot, very powerful shot. As you've just learned, the knee shot is a very powerful weapon. It can drop anybody. Its impact is tremendous. Now let's take a look at this knee shot in action. Watch carefully. Here's the block, the heel palm, the knee to the groin, then grabbing the head and knee to the face. Two knee shots quickly. You've just learned two powerful strikes, the heel palm and the knee. They're easy to learn, they're always there when you need them, easy to form. When you hit somebody with these weapons, they usually drop. Now let's look at another real life situation. This time it's a woman and it could happen to any woman. This scene uses finger pokes to the eyes, a very effective weapon. Let's learn how to do them. Now the next strike we have is called the thumb poke. When you poke with the thumb, we have the thumb against the wrist, we poke forward. Now I'm going to show you how we'd use this, in, for instance, in a, in a bear hug where Paul would have his hands around me like this and I can't move, all right? I'm in a bear hug right now. I can't move. So I come in immediately and I poke to the eyes. From here, you notice how the thumb is against the hand, not loose, protected by chambering and against the hand. I poke straight in. If I miss, I push the eyeball. If I come in and I hit there, I drop and push that eyeball in. So from here, I'm in a bear hug. I can't move backwards. I can't get away from it. He's got a lot of power on me. My hands are free though, you notice? So immediately I attack the eyes. If he does this, he could break my back. So I'm justified in attacking the eye. If he's a 300 pound wrestler, he breaks my back in a second, I'm through. There's no more self-defense for me. And size is important. A 300 pound wrestler's got an edge on me. I'm 190. Against 300 pounds, I don't have much of a chance unless I move fast to key targets. And that's what I'm teaching you. The power strikes of combat karate 
Even against a powerful wrestler, you poke in his eye, he's going to stop. So you poke from here right into the eye. Thank you, Paul. Now, the idea of poking into the eye, again, it's a straight line strike like a cobra snake. In and out, in and out. You have to practice that move. When you poke like that, make sure the thumb is against the hand, not loose. You poke straight in. If you miss, you simply push the eyeball in. A one quarter inch penetration into the eyeball is all it takes to produce a catatonic fit. You puncture that eyeball with that thumb, they'll drop to the ground quickly, right? And that's what you use if fighting for your life. Now I'll show you some other pokes with the fingers. In addition to the thumb, you have two finger pokes, in and out, hitting both eyes. You can use four fingers, in and out, same thing, like a cobra snake, in and out. Two fingers, four fingers, you can use one finger, support the index finger, in and out like that. They're short strikes, usually six, seven inches. Whew. Very hard to hit the eye, because people will close it and they'll clench. They'll use the eye socket and the muscles here to protect the eyeball. So it's not so easy to get at the eye. But if they've grabbed you like that and they don't expect it, you can poke quickly. Very good for a woman against a rapist. If she's grabbed, she's got her hands free, if the eyes are there, poke in fast. Now, another strike against the eye is called a tiger's claw, in which we claw like a tiger. Notice how the fingers form the hand that resembles the claw of a tiger. This is for scratching the eyes, coming in, whoo, like that. Someone stands here, they rush me, I come in at them, I loop in an arc like that, whoo, and I scratch right across. I don't want to scratch down because then it's not going to get into the eyes. The brows will protect the eyes. You're scratching up to get into the eyes. Even if they're wearing glasses, the first finger will clear the glass and the other fingers scratch. So you have to practice scratching like a tiger. Left hand, right hand. Again, this comes from those windmills I told you about. Those outward windmills. It's an example of those strikes. See that tiger claw. That tiger claw can rip eyes, can scratch eyes. Again, with a woman with long fingernails, very good defense for her to practice this weapon. Practice those circles. Step in and strike. Step in and strike. Step back and strike. If someone rushes you, you're clawing the eyes. Finger pokes don't require great size or mass. They're very effective even for a small person. Let's take a look at finger pokes in action. Here's the poke to the eyes. Finger pokes are simple and easy to learn. The beautiful thing is they stop an aggressor instantly. You poke a rapist in his eye and he stops quickly. Let's look at another real life situation. What are you looking at? I wasn't looking at anything. You calling me nothing? Are you calling me nothing? What are you calling nothing? I'm gonna bust you all over this bar. The first power strike was the chop. Let's learn how to do it. The next power strike is the chop. Now, one of the uses for the chop would be against somebody coming at you with a knife, and Paul is gonna assist me here. Paul is going to stand behind me. He's got his hand on my shoulder. I spin around with my head and I see there's a knife. Instead of trying to block that knife, which is going to be impossible, especially if I'm taken by surprise like this, instead I step in and I chop right into his Adam's apple. Now this is a death shot. If you hit that and break that Adam's apple, that thyroid cartilage, you break it, they're dead. All right, and they're going to drop that knife real quick. So I don't worry about the knife. As the Japanese Musashi said, Miyamoto Musashi was a great Japanese swordsman of 300 years ago. He said, think only of the cut. Think only of the cut. Think only of the strike. So in combat karate, we train you to attack the attacker. So again, if Paul grabs me here, I come right in and attack the Adam's apple. Thank you, Paul. Now, it's very important for you to train to attack the attacker. That's the difference between combat karate and sport karate. Sport karate is a game. The game is to win trophies. It's an ego trip to win trophies and to become champion. Nothing wrong with that. That's why people go into sports, for ego trips. What's wrong with an ego trip? Nothing at all. But there's a big difference between any sport and the real McCoy. You don't have sport shooting in the infantry when you're in combat. It's for real. If you're on the street and you're attacked, it's for real. There's no judge. There's no time. There's no starting signal. You better be able to react and you better be able to hit hard. 
All right, now how do you chop? You chamber the thumb and flex these fingers. The hand is not like this, and you never want to chop with the side of the hand. You don't want to develop callus here. People who tell you that are ignorant. They're amateurs. When you chop, you want to hit with the hand chambered back on the wrist so that all the force goes into the target. If I hit with the side of the hand, you notice how the hand is going to give. It's going to bend back. So I'm going to lose part of the force. When the hand is chambered back, absolutely no give. If I'm coming down on a brick or somebody's clavicle bone, no give. What do I hit with? I hit with this meaty section at the base of the palm and this bone at the end of the wrist. Never the side of the hand because if you do, there's going to be give. So you want no give and that's what you hit with. Now to chop properly, chamber the thumb. Keep the hand open like this. If the hand is this way, it's weak. It's got to be chambered, thumb cocked. Fingers open and bent. Don't have too much tension or you'll slow down. Your muscles will be tightened up and you won't get speed. And remember, in fighting, it's speed that counts because impact is mass times speed squared. So the faster you move, that speed squared, the more your impact when you hit that target. So you cock the hand like this, bent in towards the thumb. The hand is here and you swing like that. Notice now how I'm getting a full turn. See how the waist turns. See how the body center moves. I can step in and move the body center further. But the key thing is to chop in a circle. That's a wide chop. Here's a short chop. I'm chopping to the Adam's apple. Boom, like that. Real short. Now, the sport karate schools, Japanese, Korean, teach you linear chops. These are terrible chops. Very little power. They chop like this, or they chop down like that. All linear. Our chops down, circle down. Boom, like that. Our chops to the side, like that. These chops have double the force of sport karate chops the Japanese and the Koreans teach. They're not into combat karate. That's my game. This is what I work on, how to develop power. And the most important thing to remember in chop, you use the Chinese kung fu chop, full circles. They always ridicule Chinese systems as soft, just the opposite. The Chinese systems hit the hardest of all the systems. They look soft, but they generate speed. And it's speed that made Marciano the punchy he was. It's speed that gives you chopping power. So remember the principle of that circle, move that waist, cut right through the target. It's freewheeling. You don't stop the chop here. You freewheel right through the target. Now I'll show you with Paul how we would chop to the various targets of the neck. We showed you the Adam's apple. I'll just bring Paul over here. We had the Adam's apple, side of it. Vegas nerve right in here. This is a knockout point. This can be lethal. Huh? Right in here, Adam's apple. You want to knock somebody out, take the vagus nerve. Another chop would be coming down into the brain stem, coming down like this, chopping down and through. The hand makes a circle and chops into that brain stem. That's a knockout point. Thank you, Paul. The reason it's a knockout point when you hit the brain stem at the base of the neck, the brain stem is in all three brains, three parts of the brain. All right, the brain stem controls consciousness. It controls the heart rate. It controls blood pressure. It controls breathing. You attack the brain stem by coming down at the side of the neck or you hit the back of the neck, high in the neck, not the cervical vertebrae, but the brain stem itself, which is high above the cervical vertebrae. You hit that by chopping to the side, to the neck, or to the brain stem, or you want to come down into the base of the neck, you chop down. Notice how my body center drops when I hit. I don't stay like this and hit, do this kind of a weak chop, which is Japanese, Korean, real weak chops, terrible stuff. Don't learn that stuff if you want to fight for your life. Learn that stuff if you want to compete and think you're great and win tournaments. You want to fight for your life, you learn the Chinese Kung Fu shot. Boom, go right through that target. Wham! The body center, 360, boom! From here you hit like that. You've just learned the chop. Remember, the main target for the chop is the neck because it's rigid. Let's take a look at the chop in action. Are you calling me nothing? What are you calling nothing? I'm gonna bust you all over this bar. Here's the chop oh, on the upswing. You've noticed there's another power strike in this scene. It's called the upswing. Let's learn how to use it. The next power strike is the upswing. 
you hit with the top knuckle of the hand in a full 360 circle. The secret is a full swing. A box's uppercut can only traverse so much because the fist is turned in. So you can only go so high. Therefore, you can only generate so much speed. By simply turning the fist down, you can now traverse a full 360 circle. Boom! Like that. So when you hit, bam, it's triple the force of the uppercut because it's over double the speed. Watch the speed of my hand as I hit this way. Now watch the same hand bam, like that as you hit with the upswing. The upswing is right into the jaw, middle knuckle hitting the jaw. Don't hit with the flat of your hand or you might break it. When you hit, you want to hit with the hand bent. You see how my hand is bent on the wrist right now. I'm going to hit with the knuckle. If the hand were flat, I'd be hitting with the back of the hand and I'd break these small bones against the jawbone. By simply turning the wrist up, I hit the striking point, which is the middle knuckle. Now this won't break, but it will break the jawbone. One quick shot to it. <clears throat> That's all she wrote. Now I'll show you how you'd use that in a fight. Paul will come in here. Let's say we're in a clinch or in close fighting. Maybe I'm half knocked out already. But that chin is there. It's exposed. Instead of punching back, I see the chin is there. I come in with the upswing. I take it like this. If I miss, I continue the shot and hit the bladder area with the same weapon. So from here in infighting, I see that jaw is up. I do an upswing instead of an uppercut, which only goes this far. The upswing now goes 360. I hit him, comes flying back. If I miss, into there. Thank you, Paul. Now the great secret of that blow is the 360 circle. From here, I hit like that. So if you want to get power on this, you have to practice that circle wide to develop the muscle structure. Then cut the arc. Make it a real small shot. Bend that elbow. Even with a small shot, a bent elbow, boom, like that, you have knockout power. I can knock somebody out seven inches of arc is all I need. Hey, like that. Notice also, I move the body center up. Since the strike is up, the body center moves up. Always move the body center in the direction of the strike. Forward, to the side, or backwards, move that body center. So here, watch the body center is here. As I hit, the body center rises. Hey, like that. Now I'm exaggerating to show the point. You make a small move to the body center, get a good 360 circle, boom, like that, and you have power. You just saw the upswing to the jaw. It could also be used against the face if the face is forward enough. Let's take a look at the upswing in action. I'm gonna bust you all over this bar. Here's the chop, followed by the upswing. One, two, real quick. You've just seen the chop and the upswing in combination. When you use combinations, the weapons are real fast. One follows the other immediately. Now let's look at another real life situation. This is at a car scene, in which we have an argument over a parking space. And you know, people have actually been killed in arguments like this. Let's take a look at the scene. My spot. My spot. You understand? Move your car. I'm sorry, I didn't I've know been it was... wait I've been waiting for that spot. I didn't know it was your spot. Well, it is my spot. Now move it. Okay, I'll move it. You better believe you'll move it or I'll move it for you. All move right. it now. Alright, take it easy. Give me a break. Will I'll you? Break, I'll break your arm. The first strike in this scene is the leopard's palm. Let's learn how to use it. The next power strike is the leopard palm. We're hitting with the base of the palm, and the blow is a circle blow. You notice the full articulation of the shoulder joint to get a full 360 circle. Now the blow can be wide, or it can be short simply by bending the elbow. Now we have a short strike, and here's a wide strike. All right, this blow has a lot of power. Wham! We come up, and we hit down, boom, like that. 
The body center drops, the arm comes back, up in the air in a loop, and comes down in conjunction with the body center drop. <laughs> like that. A lot of power to the strike. Weapon again is the base of the palm. And Paul is going to come in here now, and we're going to show how this would work. Against a right kick, we're going to do it in slow motion. As Paul kicks, I block with an inward windmill, and from here, I come over and down on his head. So we'll do this again. As Paul kicks, I block and come in, hitting the temple, jaw hinge, or indeed the skull itself, coming right down on the skull. Thank you very much, Paul. Now, the skull is not a likely target, you think, for a knockout, but it is. And this bone here happens to be developed. Now, I don't believe in training people to develop their natural weapons to harden them. I did it myself because I've been in the karate game many, many years. And to be black belts, we had to break bricks and wood boards. And I chipped the knuckles, calcified them. The bone here is calcified. I don't recommend it to people because you could get arthritis from it. In fact, some karate masters today can hardly close their fists because their hands are calcified from so much of this breaking. So I don't train people in that. I use the natural weapons of the body just as they are. And this is a powerful natural weapon right here. It's the bone right at the end of the wrist. The arc of the circle, the 360 of the circle, is what gives the power. That's what generates the power, that circle. Remember, most karate systems are linear. You get so much power out of linear, but you get much more power out of pure circles. So the circle combined with the body center's movement forward and drop. From here, I drop down. And if I hit the skull, it can crack the skull wide open because that weapon is strong. Boom! <laughs> like that. Now, this shot was Rocky Marciano's knockout shot. He used a fist because he was a boxer wearing gloves. Quite often, his thumb hit the person's skull and he broke his thumb on many occasions. Most of his knockouts were with his looping right. Marciano was heavyweight champ over 20 years ago, 5'10 and a half, 187 pounds, one of the hardest hitters in boxing in this century. Dynamite hitter. And he got his power from this particular principle of the circle going up, over, and down. And that's what we use in a leopard palm. Up, over, and down with the body weight. <laughs> Hitting hard. <laughs> and you hit the skull, you can crack the skull. It's a knockout point. Most people don't think you're going to aim for their skull. Especially if they're coming in close. They think you're going to hit the head. You come up over and down right on the skull. And very few people know how to block a strike against the skull. Okay, Paul is going to come in and we're going to work against a, uh, a grab to my head, known as a headlock in wrestling. This is another use of this strike. From here I hit, and I hit the bladder area. Pubic bone bladder area. Boom! Thank you, Paul. Now that's a minor strike. You're striking on a plane parallel to the floor. The other strike was up, over, and down. This circle is parallel to the floor, and you hit, and you pull through. You don't hit and stop, you pull right through the target. So it's like that. And you're hitting with the base of the palm right into the bladder. It's a good strike. But remember, it's a secondary strike. This is not a knockout point. This just softens somebody up, weakens them for a knockout strike. We're covering here basically the power strikes of combat karate that can immobilize people. Let's take a look at the leopard palm in action. Better believe you're moving or I'll move it for you. All move right. it now. All right, take it easy. Give me a break, will I you? If you get Bray, I'll break your arm. Here's the leopard palm and the chop, followed by the reverse blade. The other shots in this scene are the chop and the reverse blade. We've covered the chop before. Let's learn how to use the reverse blade. Finally, we have a reverse blade shot that I showed you before, hand chambered back. You're coming into the groin, coming into the neck. So you'd hit the groin, whoo, like that, smashing in. Now that's not a power strike. When you hit the groin with the reverse blade, it's a weak shot to weaken somebody. Whoo, they get hit, and you can follow up with a power strike. Again, hitting the side of the neck here with the reverse blade normally doesn't have the same power as the chop itself. So I don't consider that a power strike. It's a minor strike. Let's take a look at the reverse blade in action. We're hitting the vagus nerve on the side of the neck, a knockout point. Better believe you'll move it or I'll move it for you. All move right. it now. All right, take it easy. Give me a break. If you get Bray, I'll break your arm. Here's the leopard palm and the chop, followed by the reverse blade. 
You've just learned the leopard palm and the reverse blade. The leopard palm gets its name because it imitates the striking action of a leopard. Now you can go up and over, or you can go parallel to the ground. Rocky Marciano used this strike in boxing. He went up, over, and hit the skull. In this particular case, we went parallel to the ground. The reverse blade, you can strike the neck, or you can change the angle and strike the groin, coming in and up. All right, now let's learn some more power strikes. These are using the fingers. Two of them are called the eagle's claw and the hand yoke. Let's begin by learning the eagle's claw. Now we'll show you another technique called the eagle's claw. The eagle's claw is formed with two fingers, the thumb and the index finger. Notice how I open and close the fingers like that. All the power is from the thumb and the index finger, okay? Do not support the index finger with one of the other fingers, you'll lose power. Some systems of karate teach you to use all four fingers and the thumb. Very weak. Try it yourself and you'll see. You have to have the index finger separate from these other fingers. All the force is in the index and the thumb. And you work it. We practice every day. Hundreds of moves like this. In and out, squeezing to get strength, grabbing strength with those two fingers. All right? We also practice this, this movement. You notice how I'm closing and opening the finger. This is to grab the testicles. All right, you have to have power if you grab the testicles to grab them, squeeze and pull. So we work closing and opening the fingers. The tiger's claw I showed you before was clawing to the eyes, finger pokes, thumb pokes and pushes. And we also teach you closing and opening like this. So that if you have to have grabbing strength, you develop it by opening and closing with tension. All right, now this other one is a lethal shot called the Eagle's claw, you strike like a cobra. Again, it's a linear strike, straight in and out. Boom, like that, straight in like that. When you hit the target, you close. And I'll show you with Paul. As Paul, let's say, has me in a, in a bear hug again, and he hasn't got as much force on me as before. So I'm able to step back. Let's say from here, just come over a little bit, Paul. From here, I step back like that. Now notice, stepping back releases tension on my backbone, okay, on the base of my spine. See, just by leverage, this position, I've broken his ability to hurt me, all right? The leverage is what helps me, it's physics. See what I do? He's got me in a bear hug, I step back like that to relieve pressure. At the same time, I grab. My hands are free, I step back to relieve pressure, to reduce his leverage, and I squeeze right in here. Now I'll show you what we're at. We'll do a close-up of this, and we're squeezing with this finger and the thumb. We're grabbing right behind the windpipe. And from this angle, I think you can see it. We're right behind the windpipe in here. Now, we're squeezing hard. If we squeeze and pull out, that's lethal. That can kill. If you had a fight for your life, you'd never think twice about doing that, all right? If somebody had a knife in you now, you'd squeeze and pull out with all you had. But if you want to immobilize somebody high on drugs, for instance, that don't feel pain, you squeeze hard in there, and they'll feel it. They'll drop. So remember, we're going behind the windpipe with the index finger and the thumb, and we're squeezing hard behind the windpipe. Thank you, Paul. Now, what does that do when you squeeze in hard behind the windpipe? That controls the method of breathing. The systolic and diastolic breathing wave is controlled by muscle structure in the larynx, right in that windpipe area. You don't have to be an expert in anatomy to learn this. All you have to do is know that you go wind behind the windpipe, deep in, squeeze hard. When you try this, be very cautious when you work with a partner because you can harm somebody quickly if you don't know what you're doing. But you squeeze, now increase the pressure until the person really reacts. That's the critical point. If you squeeze past that, you'll drop them, you'll immobilize them. They'll go like this. They won't move because they're in fear of their life, even if they're high on drugs and they don't feel punches or kicks. You squeeze hard, they'll feel it. Remember, if you squeeze hard and pull out, squeeze and pull, that's lethal. That means you're gonna pull loose the breathing apparatus behind that windpipe. And if you break that windpipe and you break that breathing apparatus, all they can do is exhale air. They need a tracheotomy quick. So that's lethal. You'd have to use it only when that's justified. So those are some of the key finger moves we use here. We use grabbing to grab the testicles. We use scratching to the eyes. We poke to the eyes with various weapons. And we use these two fingers to get at the Adam's apple windpipe area to get in deep into that larynx. You've just learned the eagle's claw, a very powerful strike. It's used to hold and subdue someone. 
A strike just like it is the hand yoke. The hand yoke is formed by the web of skin between thumb and forefinger. You hit with this hand yoke right into the Adam's apple. This weapon has only one target, the Adam's apple. If you hit it hard enough, you'll drop someone. You move like a cobra, in and out. So the strike is in fast. The beauty of the strike is it comes from a hands down position so that you don't look like you're ready to fight. And it's very hard to block because it's so fast. It comes from here straight up. And if you hit somebody hard in that Adam's apple with that web, you'll drop them. They'll fall to their knees and gasp for breath. So it's extremely effective. Now let's look at another power strike, the side fist. The next power strike is the side fist. In boxing, you normally hit with a turned fist. It could turn about 45 degrees, maybe more. In karate, they full a turn 90 degrees, a full 90 degree turn, some karate strikes. All right? Each turn has its uses. The side fist has no turn, so there's less chance to give. It's locked in more right here. You notice we're going to be hitting with this knuckle right here. We're going to be hitting with the knuckle, the middle knuckle of the hand. All right? That's the penetrating point. You notice there's a straight line from that knuckle right through the fist, all the way back. All right? So when I hit back and forth like this, there's a line all right, as I'm hitting. It's not winging out. Notice how the elbow now wings out. When I turn the fist, I wing the elbow out. By keeping it turned sideways, the elbow stays in closer to my body. That's a critical thing in the principles of power hitting. When you wing out, you lose power. When you bring it in, you have true alignment, more power. Now the secret of this punch is to hit like a battering ram, a pile driver, in and out, wham, like that. You chamber the fist back and hit, wham, like that, or you can have the fist short, real forward, and hit like that. So the fist can hit from a close distance, hey! or I can hit from back here. Ah! Now when you hit, notice how my body's center moves forward. I don't hit like a robot and stand like this. As I hit, I move in. I might step in to the strike. I might shuffle in. In this particular case, I step and move my body center downward and forward ah! as I hit. Now I'll show you how we'd use this strike with Paul. Let's say Paul is in a boxing stance with his left foot forward. And put your left foot a little bit more forward, Paul. And he's going to come in with a right hook like that. He's coming in with a right hook. I block him with an outward, left outward block. It can be a fist or open hand. I hit the heart right here. I'm breaking the sternum, smashing in to break the sternum. From here, I hit chambered back and hit, or I can be in tight and just move in from here. I can hit from six inches and do the job, break that bone. It doesn't take much. If you break that, it stops the heart. That's a death shot. Nobody expects that you're going to go after the heart, after the sternum, like that. Thank you very much, Paul. Now, the secret of the power is the straight line shot, in and out like that, like a battering ram, a pile driver. Hey! You've got to get speed. You've got to drill and work on it until you get speed of that hand. But you have to have the right principles. Don't turn the fist down. You won't get penetration with that knuckle, and you'll wing the elbow out and lose power. Keep the fist sideways. You're driving right through the sternum, like that. The whole body moves into it. After you block in these outward blocks, close in fighting, they come at you with hooks like that. Let them come at hooks. Move in. Let them come at you. Blocking any of those hooks. As soon as you can, hit that heart like that. That's a death shot. You'd use that when you're fighting for your life. One of the most powerful strikes we have for straight line striking. You've just learned the side fist. This weapon is very powerful because the elbow is tucked in rather than winging out in a turn fist. Keeping the elbow tucked in results in better bone alignment and you get the effect of a battering ram, a pile driver, extremely powerful. Now let's learn another power strike, the elbow. The next power strike is the looping elbow. We strike with the heavy bone, the front of the elbow. Very powerful natural weapon. The elbow is the second weapon to the knee in natural power. The knee is heavy, so is the elbow. Knee is your best natural weapon for infighting. Elbow is your second best because of its weight, its mass can do a lot of damage. Right? Now, in the looping elbow, what we're doing is we're moving forward with the elbow. There's a forward elbow strike like this where you're hitting the ribs. So you notice how I pivot. I can be in this position, pivot the waist. If somebody is here, I'm hitting their ribs like that. See, coming in, hitting the rib cage. Notice how the elbow goes forward. Notice how the wrist is here. When I hit, the wrist is palm down. I keep the arm chambered behind the striking point for more power. 
Now the looping elbow is when I come up over and down in slow motion, I come forward with the elbow, but instead of a straight line parallel to the floor, I loop up, over, and down, almost like what we did before in that leopard palm I told you about Marciano's strike where he looped up, over, and down. We're doing the same thing. Instead of with the hand, we're doing it now with the elbow. So it's a much shorter arc, shorter radius, but tremendous power, tremendous speed, a lot of heavy weight with that elbow. So we're coming up, over, and down. It's like this. You come up, over, and hit. Notice the body weight. From here, the body center drops. I don't keep it erect like this. I drop down. So the elbow is here. It's got to come forward come up and drop down like this, and the power is devastating with that. From it, we can do a follow-up with a chop. So you hit with the elbow, chop back to the throat. But this is great force because you notice the circle. See how I articulate the shoulder. See the 360 circle I'm getting with the elbow. Again, this is Kung Fu. This is not Japanese or Chinese. The Thai kickboxers also use this shot. They learned it from the Chinese. This is pure Chinese Kung Fu. It's a circle of the elbow, and the power is the speed you get out of that circle. And then you hit the target up, over, and down. Now I'll show you with Paul how we use this in a, in a street fighting situation. Let's say Paul is, is fighting me with his right foot forward. That's okay, Paul, your right foot forward. Let's say I'm in my right foot forward, just for now, for demonstration purposes. I can't come in on Paul with this elbow, because on the way in, he's going to drill me. He's going to hit me. But let's say I've connected first with a combination of a right cross and a left jab. All right, or a right jab and a left cross, either one. I come in with two straight line shots that upset him slightly. Then I can step in and connect with that elbow shot. Notice where I'm hitting, the jaw hinge, temple area, the ear area, mastoid process. This major circle in here is a weak point in the skull. Break the jaw hinge, break the temple, break the mastoid with this shot. It's a knockout. This will drop a big person. Again, if they're high on drugs and they don't feel pain, they're going to go out from this shot because you're going to knock out their sensory system. You're going to knock out the transmission to the brain from this shot. And they're going to go out like a light. All right? It's not a death shot, but it'll put them away, put them out. And that's what this is all about, the power strikes of combat karate. And this is a power strike. So you come up over and loop. And when you hit, you come down through like that. So I just don't hit and stop. I follow through with the strike. Thank you, Paul. Now, that's important to know that when you hit, you don't stop. You come right through and down with the strike. Notice how the circle continues. I hit the target, wham, and come right through. That's the looping elbow strike. What you've just learned is the elbow as a power strike. Very powerful, can knock someone out. There are other uses for the elbow, some of which are minor strikes used to set people up. An example would be if you grab from behind, you could strike back into the ribs with both elbows. You can also use another minor strike called the headbutt, butting back with the back of your head into the person's face who's grabbing you from behind. So these minor strikes like backward elbows, downward elbows, and upward elbows are very useful, as is the headbutt. Let's study them. Now we have other elbow strikes. I showed you before front elbow strikes. Now these are not power strikes, they're to the ribs. These won't drop people. People high on drugs can take a broken rib and still come on fighting, all right? Football players can take a broken rib and still play another five minutes, all right? So that the strikes I'm showing now are not power strikes. The looping elbow is the power strike to the jaw hinge, temple, the ear area. But the front elbow to the ribs is a minor strike. If someone grabs you from behind a mugger's grip, back elbows. And you can do it in circles. Notice how I pivot from here. I pivot, hit, hit. I can also combine that strike with a headbutt back. See, if they're behind me here, here's their face. I hit with the ribs, to the ribs with my elbows in circles, and then I butt back with the head. All right, also I can butt up with the head. See, it's another shot, minor shot. Come up like that, the top of my head into somebody's jaw. Boom, if I'm grabbed from the front. I teach this to women who are normally smaller and therefore shorter normally than their attackers for defense against rape or a mugger grabbing them from behind and he should butt back with the back of your head. Butt up with the front of your head. All right, now we also have straight line shots to the face, for instance, or the sternum coming back, boom, with the elbow. So we teach these minor strikes. They're not gonna knock people out, they're not gonna drop them, but they're useful to get away from things. All right, we also have a downward elbow strike coming down like this, somebody's arms coming down and then up to the jaw, down again onto the sternum. 
So we have downward elbow strikes, upward to the jaw, boom, down to the sternum. So from this angle, you come down, up to the jaw, down on the sternum. Those are some of the strikes we use. These are minor strikes. Remember, the power strike is the looping elbow, and if you hit somebody there, you're going to drop them no matter how big they are. We've just learned some minor elbow strikes as well as head butts. Now you can butt with the head coming up, coming forward, or coming backwards. A very good weapon. Very effective, close-in self-defense. Well, let's take a look at another minor strike, the double palm shot. Another shot would be the double palm shot. And Paul, I'll ask him to come in without the club this time. And I'm going to show you the double palm shot, which would be, this would be against Paul's chest. I'll just bring Paul over a little closer. I'm hitting to drive him away to knock him down. This is a minor strike now. This is not one of the power strikes of combat karate. I just showed you the first power strike, the heel palm to the nose, eye socket, or chin. Now a minor strike, just to get someone out of the way, would be a double palm strike hitting the chest right in here by the sternum. Not too low or I won't be able to get the palms in. The fingers will hit. Not too high or it'll glance off. I want to hit him square on this high sternum area. So the blow would be hitting like this, see, smashing in. And if especially if he's in a stance like this, where he doesn't have good balance to the rear, where he's unstable to move that way, I can knock him literally right through the air and off his feet. Thank you very much, Paul. And I'll show you that strike. What we do is we chamber the hands. From here, we strike and we hit. Again, from here, we hit. Now you notice when I hit, not only are the hands moving forward, I'm moving the body forward by stepping in. I move the body center from here and I go to a bow and arrow stance. The body center moves and drops as the hands hit. And again. Now that's a minor strike, but a useful strike. You just learned the double palm shot. A minor strike, but it can knock someone off their feet. Now, we emphasize in McSweeney's self-defense system use of the hands, elbows, and knees, with minor emphasis on the feet. Why don't we use the feet for high kicking to the head? Well, it's not easy to use high kicks to the head in all situations. For instance, how do you use high kicks in a crowded bar, in a phone booth, in a car, or if you squeeze next to another car, is in the car scene. Hands are versatile. You can use them in any situation, including the ones I just mentioned. Hands are more precise. They're also more powerful because you get more speed with the hands. Knockout power impact is mass times speed squared. So speed is the key element. Most people can't get their legs to move fast enough for a knockout. So we don't emphasize high kicks to the head. We use the hands to get to the head. We want to hit the neck with a chop. We use the hand to hit the neck, not the foot. The hand is more precise, the hand is faster, so you're going to get more power for knockout. We do use low kicks. The kicks are to set people up for power strikes for knockout. And we're going to demonstrate some of these low kicks to you now. Now, what are some of the low kicks we use? All right, an example would be a thrust kick to the hip. Here I'm in a fighting stance. A target is far away, away from me. I kick, wham, just like that. Just come in and kick with the heel or the flat of the foot right here to the hip joint. So when I hit it, he set up for a looping elbow as an example. And I can do combinations. I can kick, side fist, looping elbow. I can kick, looping elbow, chop. Those are some combinations you can work out of in these power strikes. So that's a good thrust kick to the hip to buckle somebody up. Another one would be a snap kick to the testicles, to the groin. Left foot leads, you snap in like that. Someone is here, a boxer standing right there. I snap in, hit the groin. Another kick would be to the knee. A side kick into the knee joint. Kick with the heel. Don't kick with the side of the foot because you may harm or sprain the ankle joint from the force. Don't bend and hit with the side. You see what happens when you hit? If you work that a lot, you're going to sprain that ankle joint. Hit with the heel. Heel first, like that. Not blade first. But that's driving in to buckle the knee. Whew! For a power shot. So, yes, we use low kicks. That's an example to the knee. Another one we use is a tie boxing kick, where you kick with the end of the leg. They work the shin itself. I don't. They drill to train the shin to be tough. They hit against banana trees. 
to toughen the shins up. But Thai boxers have a short life. They fight for four or five years and then they become crippled because of the terrible damage they take to their legs. In Thai boxing, they actually attack the leg. In American kickboxing, you have to kick from the waist up. You're not allowed to kick the legs. And I think it's a good thing because the damage is tremendous to the legs when you kick them. But for street fighting, self-defense, I do teach low kicks, including this Thai boxing kick where I come in, I'm going to hit the thigh right here. I come in, I whip in, whoom, like that. See, it's a hook. The leg arcs out in a hook, circles in, and I hit with the bottom of the leg just before it meets up with the foot itself. Right at the joint, right here. That's what I hit with. And it won't hurt. If I hit with the shin, it'll hurt me. So don't hit with the shin. Hit with the end of the leg bone itself, right there. And so what I do is I come in and I hit, whoo, and hit, all right? So again, from the hit with the kick, I can use another shot like the looping elbow. I kick with this Thai roundhouse kick to the thigh bone, and then a looping elbow into the jaw. Now, another thing we can do is a front thrust kick, and Paul is going to help me with this. What we do is the same thing as before, where I had the jumping knee. I'll show you with Paul. Paul will stand right here, and I'm going to be in a position like, we'll move Paul over here a little bit, Paul. Good. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be in a position where I'm leading off like a southpaw boxer. I'm going to jump in and kick with the front. So I'll hold that about like that, Paul. So what I'm doing is jumping in and kicking with the front leg. I'll do it again. I'll do it with medium power. From here I kick like that. We'll hold it about like that, Paul. Just like that angle. I'll kick a little higher. I'm chambering the knee up to get some height. Then I kick straight out with the heel to get impact. And remember, I'm kicking with the front leg. The French boxers use this, the Sabat fighters. You jump off the rear foot and kick like that. Thank you, Paul has a lot of power. Again, that's not designed to knock somebody out, but you can knock them down with a shot like that. So those are some of the things we do with the kicks. Now, I normally tell people, never kick against a wrestler. A wrestler is trained to grab. If he gets a hold of you, he'll throw you right on your back. Usually you kick against a boxer or a street fighter who's not a skilled wrestler. You just learned low kicks, very useful for setting someone up for a power strike to knock them out. Again, these kicks were to low body targets such as the hip, the thigh, the knee. We're not kicking to the head for the reasons we described before. Also, if you practice through life and use a lot of high kicks, you're gonna strain your back, you're gonna strain your legs, you're gonna strain the knee joint, you're gonna hyperextend it. Legs weigh a lot. Arms weigh one third what legs weigh. So you can practice with the arms through life. And if you want to maintain striking ability with the hands and the elbows and the knees, it's very simple. No stress, no strain throughout your entire lifespan. And remember, we're talking entire lifespan when we talk self-defense. Sport karate is for young people, teenagers, preteens, people in their 20s. Very few people over 30 compete in sport karate. But that's a sport. You engage in it, win trophies, you quit. Self-defense is lifelong. The whole psychology is you're able to use violence to defend yourself if ever you have to defend yourself. And you don't know whether that's going to be in your 20s, your 50s, your 70s, your 80s. Now, self-defense is not easy unarmed if you're weak and feeble. That's when you need a weapon. And that's what we're going to discuss now, armed self-defense. Now, who would need to learn armed self-defense? How to fire a handgun, how to fight with a knife, well, a lot of people in their work need this. For instance, policemen or police women, bodyguards, security personnel who carry weapons to guard money, to guard people, to guard places. So these people have to use a handgun and know how to, have to know how to use a handgun. What about the ordinary citizen? Well, I know from personal experience from people I've trained some of the reasons why people learn to use a handgun and why they own and possess a handgun. Now, most states allow you to own and possess a handgun at your home or place of business. Very few states give you the right to carry it concealed. So you have to check out the laws in your own state. However, I have personally trained women who have been raped and carry handguns because they said it'll never happen to them again. Whether it's legal or illegal, they could care less. They say no one will ever rape me again because it was so destructive to them spiritually and mentally. 
The physical damage is nothing compared to the mental damage from rape. Now, who else would learn to fire a handgun or want to? A woman living alone or with children in a crime-ridden neighborhood where there have been home invasions. These people have handguns. Some of them have shotguns. How about people who live in a crime-ridden neighborhood and they have a business? The business has been robbed. I've known people who have been robbed and beaten, pistol whipped, even though they gave the money. These people tell me it'll never happen again and they keep a handgun. Now, if you have a handgun and someone comes at you with a superior weapon like a machine gun, a submachine gun, a rifle, an automatic rifle, or a shotgun, you don't draw the handgun, you're outgunned. And if someone has the drop on you, you don't draw. So you don't use the handgun in a stupid way. I'm going to train you the proper way of firing a handgun, which is point shooting. In the movies, Dirty Harry takes a big 44. This happens to be a 45 auto. But he's got a big 44, a cannon, the recoil of which would knock your head off. He's got that with two hands. He aims down the street and he pops away. That's not the good way to use a handgun. The way I teach you to use a handgun is one-handed, sense of direction pointing, just like pointing your finger. That's what I'm going to teach you. Now, what's my background in handguns? I have a background in karate for many years, but I have to fill you in on why I know something about handguns. Well, I have a heavy military background. I was a gunner in the Navy in 1945 and 46 during World War II on an amphibious ship. I served as a first lieutenant, a security officer with the United States Air Force throughout the entire Korean War, over two and a half years in Japan, the Far East, and Korea. So I got used to heavy emphasis on weapons. I did a lot of bodyguard work. Then I spent seven years in the Army Reserve active as an infantry captain. So I'm used to firing all types of infantry weapons. So weapons have been my background from the age of 17, and I've never stopped learning about weapons. I also write for many weapons magazines, gun magazines. So I'm known in the field as an authority on point shooting. I'm not going to teach you aim shooting. That has its uses for long range firing. But point shooting is where combat handgun usage is at. For instance, 50% of all gunfights take place within five feet. At five feet, you cannot look at the front post of your sight. If someone is firing at you at five feet, you can't take the gun up, look at the front post, and fire away. The reason is fear, the tacky psyche effect. You have fear to your life from instant death, an immediate source. So you look at the threat to your life. That's the tacky psyche effect. All you can do is look at the threat. You can't look at the front post of your sight. A physical impossibility. That's at five feet. Half of the gun battles take place there. 87% within five yards, 15 feet, and almost 100% within 12 yards. So why should people learn to fire at 25 yards, wearing earmuffs and glasses, at targets that are 25 meters away, two-handed shooting? Of course it's precise. You need to aim if you're going to hit a target 25 yards away. But that's not the way it comes down in a gunfight. A gunfight usually takes place at night, 70% at night or in dim light, where you couldn't see a sight anyway. Most of them so close that you'll be looking at the threat and you're going to be firing automatically. Unless you learn how to fire with my method of point shooting, you're going to miss. You're going to jerk the trigger, you're going to pull the muzzle, you're going to miss. So I'm going to teach you how to fire these weapons. The weapons I'm going to teach you to fire right now, you're going to use the revolver, all right? I recommend the snub revolver for self-defense. For citizens, it can be carried in a purse or a pocket. For policemen the same way, or police women the same way, or in a holster. The reason I like the revolver is simplicity. Simplicity of function. All you do is point, pull the trigger. The weapon is always loaded, there's no safety to worry about. So you're going to learn in the following sequence how to fire the handgun in combat. I just fired six rounds in bursts of two at a silhouette target, five yards, sense of direction firing. This is merely pointing. The object is simply to hit the target. We're not looking for pinpoint accuracy, but mainly to hit the silhouette at five yards. I will now unload the weapon. Unload the weapon by opening the cylinder, turn the muzzle up so the gravity helps you to unload and eject the rounds, the empty rounds. Place the weapon down, keep the muzzle downrange at all times for safety purposes. In loading, 
take fresh ammunition, take the weapon in the left hand if you're a right-handed shooter, keep the muzzle downrange, now point the muzzle down so that gravity helps you in feeding, and load your rounds. This ammunition that I'm firing is reload ammo. So the shell cases have been used before. It's not as smooth and fitting in the chambers. Put the weapon down, keep the muzzle down range at all times. I will now fire at two targets, putting one round at a time in each target in bursts of twos. One round left, then one round right. This demonstrates the swing, swinging from target to target when you have multiple assailants to the front. All six rounds hit the target. Again, we're not looking for pinpoint accuracy, but you notice these rounds are in the center of the silhouette. They would hit the human body. Again, in unloading the weapon, I kept the muzzle downrange, ejected the shells, used gravity to help me, and put it down. This demonstrates the simplicity of point firing. It's instinctive. My body is in a boxer's stance. The weapon is held in front of me, under the eyes, the eyes concentrate on the targets. I do not concentrate on the gun at all. The target or my threat is what I concentrate on. If that was someone firing back at me, I look at them and return fire. In this case, all rounds are in the silhouette, basically in the center. As I mentioned earlier, the two-handed method of aimed fire in a weaver stance or anything like that, which is prevalent today, is based on a wrong premise. And that premise is that there's a direct correlation between sport shooting at targets which don't fire back and combat shooting at someone who's already firing at you. I say there's no correlation because of the tacky psyche effect. Tunnel vision makes you concentrate on the target to the exclusion of everything else, including the front sight. No way at two yards and five yards, which is the combat ranges. Remember, 50% of handgun fights take place within three yards, within five feet. 90% within five yards. No way are you going to draw a weapon at someone firing at you at two, three, and five yards away and aim that sight and fire. What you're going to do is draw the weapon and begin firing automatically because your concentration, your vision is on that threat, on that target. As soon as the weapon clears the holster, you'll start to fire. And unless you're trained, the rounds will hit the floor, they'll hit to the side, they'll hit up above. You must be trained in the point firing method so that you'll have automatic reactions, spontaneous reflex action. Because in a combat gunfight, the thinking mind is not an action. The subconscious mind takes over. So the premise of modern day pistol shooting is absolutely wrong. And it's the reason why the police are such miserable shots, hitting only one out of four. What we've got to do is convince people to go with the flow. And the point method is going with the flow, and that's what I'm going to demonstrate right now. In the point method, the first thing is the grip. Have a strong grip on the gun. Make sure that the thumb holds the weapon. Don't have the thumb loose. It holds the weapon. Don't have a death grip because that locks up the motor nerves. It locks up the muscles. You be too tight, it's no good. But don't be too loose in your grip or you lose the weapon. Have a good strong grip, thumb holds the weapon. Now the pull consists of pulling rapidly, like that. You don't want a two-stage pull where you pull the hammer back with one stage and then release it in the second stage. That's used in aimed fire. You pull with the first digit right here, the joint right here, the first joint is what you pull with, not the pad. So you get a good grip, get the finger inside the trigger guard and pull with that joint. Now it's a rapid pull. It's not a slow pull. It's not a squeeze. It's a rapid pull, but you don't jerk the weapon to the side. 
That will move the muzzle, you won't hit the, ra the rounds won't hit. What you want to do then is make sure it's a rapid pull like that. Now, the stance consists from shooting to the front, you step in into a boxer's stance. As you step in, you draw the weapon and aim the weapon under the eyes. The eyes concentrate on the target. You notice there's a natural alignment now between the gun, my hand, and my forearm. I don't want it turned. There has to be a straight line, gun, hand, forearm. And my body now is in line with that gun. You'll notice that the gun is under my eyes so that my vision is on the target, but the gun is under those eyes. As I come in, I fire. Now you don't come in and then hold and fire. You begin the trigger pull as soon as you clear the holster so that the round fires at the moment you're on to target. This is much faster than coming in and then firing, or in the two-handed system, coming in, gripping, aiming, and then firing. That's very slow. This is fast. You fire on the way in. Notice also <clears throat> that I'm a much smaller target. In two-handed shooting, my whole body is exposed to return fire. Here, I've reduced that by turning to the side. <clears throat> So step in and fire rapidly. Now this is not the stroke. The stroke means that through subconscious reaction, that every time you draw a weapon and point it, you automatically fire. You fire only when there's a threat. If you have to draw a weapon and you don't need to fire, hold your fire. Aim at the person, but don't fire. For instance, in a burglary attempt. You don't fire at someone unless you're certain that there's an imminent danger to your life. And you know that if someone is firing at you, or if someone is coming at you with a knife and they refuse to stop even though armed with a gun. If you tell them to stop and they keep coming, you may have to fire. So don't use the stroke system, which is you always fire as soon as you draw. What you do is draw rapidly, point, and if you then fire, because you're getting fire back at you, you fire on the way up. Now if you fire to one or more opponents in front, such as two opponents, you fire to one and then to the other. So this is called the swing. Now when we swing, we fire at the first target and we swing onto the second. Now during the swing, we fire. So the round goes off when the muzzle is in line with the target. Don't swing and then fire, that's slow. Step in, fire and fire. <clears throat> if we wanna fire to the sides, we can swing 90 degrees to the left or 90 degrees to the right. You'll notice when we swing, it's rapid. We don't do a full arc. We pull the arm back, cut the arc, like this. It's one fluid move. From here to the right, instead of a wide arc, we pull the arm back, cut the arc, and fire. Again, one fluid move. If I want to fire to my right rear, I simply turn and fire. If I want to fire directly to the rear, I pivot and fire. In this, I don't make a wide arc. I pull the arm back, cut the arc, and fire. Now I can turn and fire all the way to here. From here, I can fire to the same point. So I can cover with this system 360 degree circle without moving my body, without moving my leg. All I do is pivot on the ball of the foot and pivot from the waist. In two-handed firing, I can fire to the front, I can fire to the sides, but it's a wide arc and awkward. I can fire to this side, but no way can I fire behind me. The only way I can fire behind me is to step and pivot in a wide arc. Very slow, very poor method of shooting. This method then allows you to step in and fire, fire to another target, fire here, swing to here, swing to the rear, and back here. You can cover a full 360 degrees with this method of firing. In the draw, it's important when you practice the draw, never have the weapon loaded. There's no need to have a loaded weapon in draw practice. Drawing is simply a mechanical act to get the weapon out in front of you, to present it for firing. So draw with an unloaded weapon. When you draw for the real thing, you go through the same mechanical act, get out in front of you, and then the round will go off when needed. In drawing, reach back, unhook the button, on the holster, draw, put your finger in the trigger guard on the way out. Don't wait and put it in, that's too slow. You must put the trigger finger in during the draw, 
come forward and fire. Now this again, firing to the front, multiple targets, one and two. If there's one target, I train you as I did in the live firing earlier, two rounds at a time, one, two. If there's just one target, always bursts of two when someone is firing at you. If there are two people, you fire to the left and center again and back. So it's one, two, two, one. If there are three targets, you fire one, two, three, and then back again, one, two, three. Now, if there were three targets, you'd fire to the center if he was closest. Always fire at the closest target, the one who's the most threat or the one firing at you. But if all three are equal, start from the left, fire once, fire center, fire to the right. Now, fire at someone you missed. For instance, if this person is coming in, turn and fire. If this is coming in, fire. If this person is coming in, give another round here and then back it in. The principle is give each of the multiple targets at least one round, and then the second round to the closest threat. If it's one target, remember it's always two rounds, rapidly. This is the point method of firing. Train regularly with this, and this will save your life in an actual combat situation. In my system of point firing, mirror training is a key element. Hold the weapon at your side, step in and fire. Aim at the center where my hand is. Step in and fire. Notice if the weapon is pointing high or pointing low, left or right, and adjust accordingly. If you come in always firing high when you're aiming at the center, bring it down. The mirror will show you where you're firing. If you're coming in low, bring it up. Get to the point with constant practice, 15 minutes of practice at a time, until you can point that weapon exactly where you want. In this case, at the center, right here. You point the weapon. So come in to the stance and point. Notice how the stance is natural alignment. My eyes are right above the weapon itself. From here, I step in and fire. Begin trigger pull on the way in. Don't step in and then fire. That's slow. Begin the trigger pull. As soon as the muzzle is forward of your own body, the trigger starts to pull, and the round fires at the moment you're on to target. Practice that, stepping straight in, firing to the center. After a while, fire high to the head. Notice that the muzzle should be pointing at the head. Then practice firing low, above the knee. See that the muzzle is pointing down. You'll get used then to alignment of the muzzle with your eyes. By concentrating on the target, the hand and the gun become an extension of the eyes. The key is to concentrate on that target. In Zen archery, they say that the target itself will draw your weapon, will draw the arrow from the weapon. So here it's almost like Zen shooting. The target itself draws the bullet if you concentrate your gaze on that target. If I concentrate on my own forehead, that muzzle will point there. If I concentrate here, the muzzle will point there. If I concentrate low, the muzzle will point there. Again, see if you're firing left or right or dead on. So from this training, in the mirror, you begin to see where the muzzle points relative to where you look. To fire to the sides for multiple targets, a target here and here, you begin your swing. You fire to the front, then swing onto the target to the side and fire. Again, don't swing and then pull. Begin the pull during the swing so that when the swing stops, the round fires. So fire and then swing. If you're firing to one target in front, always two rounds. If it's multiple targets, this target one round, this target the second, and then another, and back to this. If it's three targets, firing left, center, and right, fire left, center, right, then back it in. Right, center, left. Remember now, this is point firing. 75% of all gunfights take place in dark, so you couldn't aim the sights anyway. And the tacky psyche effect means that you can't look at your front post if someone is at close range, three yards, five yards away, and actually firing at you. The only thing you can do is train yourself to react automatically. If someone is firing at you, you step in, that closes the range to the target. It also turns your body to the side, become a smaller target, and fire immediately. Fire two rounds. 
If there are two people, fire here, here, back again. Mirror training then should be practiced regularly, once a week, 15 minutes at a time. Then as you catch on to it and you do your range firing, once a month, once every two months, 50 to 100 rounds at a time for the first year. After that, you can start to do mirror training maybe once a month for 15 minutes, live range firing twice a year. Again, mirror training consists of concentrating the gaze on the target. In this case, the center, step in and fire. Check the angle of that muzzle, left or right, up or down, until it's always lined properly. You can see it in the mirror. That's the advantage of mirror training. Then practice from here, swinging to the right, firing, swinging to the left and firing. Always bursts of two, here, two, and back. That's the essence of mirror training. You've just learned handgun combat shooting using the point method of firing, which is the real way to fire a weapon in combat if you want to hit the target. And remember, hitting the target is what counts. People will talk about bullets and sizes and ballistics and a large 44, what it will do compared to a 38. The most important thing in a gunfight is just to hit the target. And that's why I recommend the 38 Special Revolver for self-defense for the average citizen or for policemen because once loaded, it's always ready to fire. Speed of firing is not as fast, but it's fast enough for our purposes. Speed of firing is not as fast as that of an automatic. The automatic or semi-automatic, the technical term for it, it's very fast in firing and fast in reloading. You use a magazine. This happens to have seven rounds in it. You push the magazine in, you release the slide, and you're off and firing. With a revolver, you don't have that speed of reloading. To reload, you have to open up the cylinder and charge one by one, or even if you use speed loaders, which are difficult under the stress of combat, you tend to be slow in reloading. So the advantage of the automatic, the semi-automatic, is firepower. It's faster to fire, and the speed of reloading is much greater than that of the revolver. But the revolver offers a little bit more dependability. It doesn't jam. Semi-automatics jam from time to time. This happens to be the Army Government Model 45. Very dependable model, very seldom does it jam because of loose tolerances. Most police departments now are using semi-automatics. 14, 15, 16 rounds in the magazine. They want that firepower, they want that speed of reloading. Now, when it comes to ammo, I recommend standard ammo. For instance, for the 38 Special, don't use hot rounds, plus P charges. They could harm the weapon, and you don't want a weapon that won't function in need. I use just standard loads. These are semi-wad cutters. This happens to be 158 grains. Standard load. It'll do the job. This is a 45, 230 grain hardball, full metal jacket. Again, this is heavy. It's bigger than the 38 Special. You can see the difference. This is the bullet. This is the cartridge case. This is the cartridge itself that holds it. You can see the difference in the size of this bullet versus that bullet. Big difference in dimensions and weight and shape. The 45 is famous for knockdown power. But I'm not a big fan of knockdown power or stopping power in handguns. My main interest is to train you just to hit the target. Remember, target placement is the most important thing, not the type of round that you hit with. For instance, a 22 to the brain will stop someone instantly. I'm not so sure about 45 slugs. An example, Babyface Nelson, back in the 30s, had a gunfight with two FBI officials, agents. He killed both of them in the gunfight, and he took 17 rounds from them from a Thompson submachine gun, 45 rounds, 17 of them in his torso. It took him hours later before he died. He drove away from the gunfight and died hours later from loss of blood. Interestingly, he weighed only 125 pounds. So I'm not a fan, as I said, of stopping power in handgun bullets. I'm more interested in just hitting the target. After that comes bullet placement. Now, as far as cleaning the weapon, once you've fired a weapon, you have to clean it as soon as possible. You normally use a solvent. This happens to be a Hoppy's Number no. 9 solvent, which I like. You dip a wire brush in it, and you clean back and forth until you get rid of all the fouling of the lead or the copper. After you've cleaned it with the wire brush, you then use a patch, you soak the patch in the solvent, and you work the patch back and forth. 
Just work it inside and clean the weapon like this. All right, keep cleaning until the patch comes out clean. You may have to use 20 patches. You keep dipping them, keep cleaning. You clean the barrel, you clean the chambers in the cylinder. The same thing with the 45. You take this apart before you clean it. I'm not gonna dis dismantle it for you now, but you take it apart, disassemble it, and you then do the same cleaning procedure with the wire brush, with the cotton. You use a solvent. You clean all parts of the gun. Then you clean it the next day and then three days later. Always clean it three times because it takes some time for the fouling to come out. Now, I never oil a weapon. I use solvents which dry, all right, and they don't use an oil residue. They don't leave us a residue or a slick. The problem with oiling weapons or using those sprays, those gummy sprays, which leave a residue, is it can tend to jam the weapon later or you lose spring pressure. So don't oil the weapon. Keep your weapon dry where it won't collect dust and dirt and gum up. So that's basically it. You've learned how to use the handgun. We showed you the proper method to use it in combat, point shooting. We told you the difference between automatics and revolvers. And for citizen self-defense, I recommend the revolver for simplicity of function. It's more dependable. It doesn't jam. But there are uses for the automatic as we discussed. Now let's go into the next segment, which is going to be knife fighting. This is a three inch lock blade pocket knife. It's small, but it's very useful if your life is on the line. It opens up a blade under three inches. You hold the blade in a strong grip, the thumb supports the grip. Don't have the thumb loose along the top of the blade. Then the hand is weak. Laterally, no support. Support it with the thumb. Fight off the same foot with the same hand. Right foot, right hand. Don't use a reverse hand because you have limited range, you have minimal control over anyone coming in. Fighting off the right foot, right hand, I can now do circle cuts. So if anyone comes in at me, I can cut his hand or wrist with these circles. I can also protect my face and throat with my other hand. So these circles are effective. From the circles, I can go from a circle to a thrust. Circling and then thrusting in. Now the thrust, use the palm up, you have a tighter grip, more control. Don't have the palm this way with the blade pointing down. You have weak control. It's an unnatural move. Always thrust with the palm up, in and out. You circle, then thrust. You can also cut, slashing, like this. When you cut, turn the wrist. When you reverse the cut, turn the wrist the other way. The object is to cut with maximum cutting surface. So turn the wrist and cut, come back and turn the wrist. You can also cut in a wide cut if someone rushes you, come back and cut and reverse cut. Your target would be the neck and the face. Don't go for the body with a small knife like this. In the thrust, target is the throat, eye socket. Remember, we're talking about fighting to protect our lives, a woman to protect herself against rape. That's what a knife is all about, to fight only when you have to protect your own life. So in this cut, we come back, cut, cut again. Now I'll demonstrate these same cuts with a marine combat knife as is larger and it gives you a better picture for demonstration purposes. Same grip, good strong grip, the thumb supports the grip, don't have the thumb on top of the blade. When you thrust, thrust with the palm up for control, not with the blade pointing down. It's an awkward move, you lose control. This is much stronger grip, much stronger thrust. Now you can thrust to the body. In the small knife, I said cut only the face, neck, open skin. You're going for arteries in the face, arteries in the neck. The object is to make somebody bleed so they run from you, they don't fight you. Remember, most people that fight with a knife go against unarmed people, so they're cowards to begin with. If you have a knife and fight back, your very will to fight will probably make them run away. And if you have some skill at all, you'll be able to cut them. You cut them once, they'll take off. Most knife fighters want to come upon a victim who's unarmed. So this system I'm gonna teach you is very simple, Practice with it, you can get it down in no time. All you do is have a good grip, come in, fight the same hand, same foot. Fight from the front. If I fought this way, the way some people teach you, you don't have the same range forward, I can't shuffle in properly, and I can't protect myself at this side. Anyone can cut me from here. This way I can do a full circle of defense to protect myself to the front, 
to the side, to this side. From the circle, I can come in and thrust. So I'm cutting his hand or wrist, then I thrust to the body, to the face, to the throat. Circle and thrust. I can slash. Again, when I slash, turn that blade for maximum cutting surface. Then come back and reverse and cut that blade. You're cutting to the face, the neck. You can do circles and then cuts. Wide cuts, if someone rushes me, I can step back and cut, then reverse cut. Going again to the neck face area. I come in in slow motion, I cut, turn that blade for maximum cutting. Come back to here, reverse, turn the blade, turn my wrist for maximum cutting. So in speed it's The knife is a very good weapon in self-defense. Women have them in their kitchens. If they're prepared to use them, they can defend their household with a kitchen knife. The movements are simple. Straight thrust, in and out. Fight off the same foot, same hand. Circle movements to cut the hands, also to block. And slashes against the face, the neck, thrust to the body, cut open skin. Work regularly, practice with the knife. All you need to do is practice maybe 10 minutes once a week, and you'll be able to be proficient in knife fighting. You've just learned knife fighting. You learned how to use a marine combat knife and the three inch lock blade. Now the marine combat knife is fine if you're a marine or you're an army infantryman, but you're not gonna carry this around with you in civilian life concealed. It's obvious that you have it. If you're gonna carry something like this, you might as well carry a gun because they're both illegal concealed. But what you can carry legally concealed is the three inch lock blade. It's a pocket knife, it folds up. Three inch is the normal legal length in almost all the states. I pass this through airway security, airline security. They simply check it, palm size, let it go. The beauty of this little knife is that if your life is ever at stake, you've got a weapon to defend yourself with. A small woman should carry this, or a woman, any type of woman, even if she's strong, should carry a knife if she's afraid of the neighborhood she lives in or if she's afraid of circumstances. So many stories of women who've been threatened, either by ex-boyfriends or ex-husbands, and they end up battered or beaten or dead. If they learned how to fight with a little pocket knife and kept this, they have a weapon. We showed you how to slash quickly to the throat. This is deadly, and we use these deadly weapons for a reason, for self-defense. We've studied now in the arms section how to use a handgun in combat, how to fight with a knife. Now, why would people use these weapons? Well, I said self-defense is violence. It's violence against violence. Self-defense has nothing to do with turning the other cheek. If you want to turn the other cheek, he'll die, all right? If you want to live, you have to defend yourself. The basic principle of the British common law is the right to self-defense. When you cannot defend yourself, you basically give up your right to life itself. You're like a lamb waiting for a wolf to devour you. That's why I always say, be prepared, carry this little pocket knife, Learn how to use a handgun if the circumstances demand it. We discussed some of the circumstances before. If you're disabled, if you're a small person, and you're up against a gang, a gang attack, you don't have a chance unless you have a handgun. So there's a use for a gun. Now, let's go to an exercise system that we discussed earlier called Tiger Moves. This is an excellent system for building the body, to keep it strong, to build the muscles, to keep you healthy. You have to have strength to use the power strikes. You can't hit like a wet noodle. You have to hit hard, and that requires muscle strength. Whether you're 130 or 230, you still have to have the muscles in shape and the connecting tissue, the ligaments, the tendons, have to be strong. And the tiger moves will do that. So now let's study tiger moves. Savage beauty. Look at that powerful body. Strength, grace, magnificent form. 
how does the tiger manage to keep himself at the peak of physical fitness for his entire life? He doesn't lift weights, work machines, perform calisthenics or aerobics, and he doesn't jog, yet he can tear the head off a man. His power comes from his own exercise system, far different from man's, and also far superior. It is the ultimate exercise system, which I call Tiger Moves. The tiger follows a training system which does no harm to his body, is highly efficient, conserves energy, and to top it all, is very simple. To exercise, the tiger does nothing more than stretch with great tension every time he changes posture or when he paces. The inner resistance he uses is so powerful, it actually builds muscles. Simple, isn't it? Not only simple, but highly efficient. Ironically, when man sets about to improve his health and physical fitness through exercise, he devises systems which lack the simple wisdom of the tiger. You yourself may have noticed that many of the exercise methods you've tried have done more harm than good. For example, take exercise machines. These machines can't accommodate all body types. So instead of working proper muscles as intended, the weight and pressure is put on the joints of the non-average sized person, resulting in joint injuries and tendonitis problems. The clean and jerk movement of free weights uses momentum. This stresses joints at the jerk point because the movement is not smooth, it's jerky. Free weights build muscles all right, but over time, they wear out joints. Yes, aerobics may have made exercise more fun, but only at the expense of the knees, ankles, feet, and lower back. Low impact aerobics has far less injuries than high impact, as does belly dancing with its smooth and completely natural moves. Running, especially if done regularly over long distances, harms joints and bones and expends energy far in excess of the body's ability to recuperate. Walking is a far better exercise than running. It is great for working the cardiovascular system, the abdomen, and the legs without the pounding injuries to the joints and bones. Also, beware of calisthenics deep knee bends that hyperextend and thus harm the knee joints, chin-ups that damage muscle fibers in the shoulders, and sit-ups that can harm the lower back. Tiger moves, the best and most natural exercise system man can use. I'm John McSweeney, and I'm gonna cover seven of these basic tiger moves. They give you symmetry of physique, power, strength, they keep you healthy. The seven moves are the barrel squeeze, the shoulder roll, the wrist twist, the high reach, the pull down, the stomach roll, and the knee bend. We'll cover all seven of these tiger moves in detail. The first tiger move is the barrel squeeze. Step forward with the left foot forward, left knee bent, right knee is flexed. This is the stance that you should do half of the moves in. So you do one set of moves, 10 repetitions per set with the left foot forward. Then alternate for the next set of moves of 10 repetitions, put the right foot forward, bend the right knee, put tension in the upper thigh, the quadriceps area. The left leg is also tense, it's straight back. We call this the bow and arrow, front bow and arrow stance. So put tension in the legs in these stances, so you'll alternate right lead and left lead. You'll do 10 reps with the right leg forward, then you do the next 10 reps with the left leg forward to change the stance so that the lead leg always has more tension in it and you're working some of the muscles in there like the quadriceps. Balance the body, hands in front, the palms face each other. Move back slowly using great tension. Then move forward using great tension.
until the beginning position. Inhale on the way back. Exhale forward. Inhale back. Exhale forward. Use great tension. Inhale back with tension. Exhale forward. A side view. A back view. The important thing about this move is to move with great tension. Weightlifting uses external resistance to build muscle fiber. The principle of the tiger move is to build muscle fiber using internal resistance. So it's not stretching like a yawning stretch, a soft stretch. The secret is tension. So again, hands in front, palms face each other, inhale back, Flex the back muscles. Hold it for the count of one, 1,000. Come forward. Now flex the pectoral muscles and hold it for a count of one, 1,000. Again. This exercise works the pectoral muscles, works the muscles of the back, the latissimus dorsi. It works the entire upper body, but the secret is internal resistance. The next tiger move is the shoulder roll. Bring the arms up so that the forearms are one above the other. Fists are clenched. Bring the arms back slowly with tension and bring the fists so that the palms are forward. Come forward, turning the fists in to the same position. This exercise is for the shoulder muscles for the deltoids. When you come forward, hold the count for one 1,000 to flex the pectorals. Come back slowly with great tension. Flex the back muscles for one 1,000. Come forward with tension as you exhale. The object is to develop the deltoid muscles of the shoulder, which are these muscles right here. When you do that, by rolling forward slowly with tension so you feel it in that muscle. The secret of tiger moves is to think into the muscle you're gonna work. Even though I'm working forearms and pectorals and back, I'm thinking into the deltoid muscles of the shoulder so that I'll make those shoulder muscles grow, that the fiber muscles, the fibers in the muscles will grow. Now the breathing in and breathing out is very important because the oxygen brings the nutrients to the body through the blood. Try to breathe low in the diaphragm area. Breathe from here, not high. A side view. Flex back, roll that shoulder muscle. This is the muscle we're working on now, the deltoid muscle of the shoulder. Come back with great tension as you inhale, flex. Come forward with great tension as you exhale and flex. That is the shoulder roll. The third tiger move is the wrist twist. Step forward this time with the right leg leading. <clears throat> Hands are in fists. The fists are back to back, arms are straight. Come back with the arms, keep the arms down, turn the hands out, lock the back, come forward with tension. Notice how the wrists turn until the original position is reached. Come back again, slowly turning the hands out, flex and hold, come forward with tension, slowly turning the wrist. The secret of this exercise is in the wrist twist. Turning of the wrist all the way back 
and coming forward and all the way in, flexes the triceps muscle. This is the muscle of the upper arm that we're working right now. Now the beauty of tiger moves is that you get a full range of motion. You also get a full expansion and contraction of opposing muscle structure. Inhale on the way back, hold, come forward as you exhale, keep the arms down, don't bring the arms up. Again, come forward with tension, twist that wrist, and feel it in the triceps muscles. Think into those muscles. Hold, come forward with great tension, feel the tension in the triceps muscles. Now come back, the arms come out, the hands open up, hold, the arms come in, the wrists turn to the original position. The next tiger move is the high reach. Stand with the feet side by side, bring one hand up, then the other. Continue moving the hands up one at a time. Now don't make this a yawning stretch. Use tension. Try to reach for the stars. Reach as high as you can with tension, great tension. Exhale on the way up. Inhale on the way down. This works the latissimus dorsi muscles of the back. It also works the trapezius muscles of the high back and the neck. This helps you from getting neck cramps. It builds the size of the neck itself, strengthens it. It also aligns the spinal column. And by reaching high, it helps to keep you stand straight and tall. Use great tension as you reach from side to side. The next tiger move is the pull down. Start with the legs side by side in a natural standing position. One arm comes down as the other is up. Pull the arms down alternately. Flex the pectoral muscles. We're working now the inner pecs. We're working the biceps and the forearms. So put tension, think into these muscles. Think into those inner pecs as you come down. Think into the biceps and the forearms. Again, great tension. Come down near the center line. Don't come down the side or you will not work this muscle group. Come down the center line. That's important. Think into the muscle group, the inner pecs. Breathe out and breathe in alternately. The next tiger move is the stomach roll. This is designed to strengthen abdominal muscles. Flex and roll down. Bring the muscles up. Flex and force the stomach muscles, abdominal muscles down, and roll them up. Force them down, bring them up. Exhale on the way down, inhale on the way up. You can inhale and exhale using both nose and mouth. Flex, force it down, come up. Now the majority of excess fat in the male is usually in the stomach abdominal area. In the female, it's usually the excess is in the thighs and the buttocks. So men have a tough job keeping their stomachs flat. We have to have some excess fat. Dieting to an extreme is not good. And if you do have a little excess fat, it's gonna be in the stomach area, especially as you get older. You're gonna notice that great athletes, boxers, wrestlers, football players have large waists. They don't have a slim waist like a bodybuilder. They have a thick waist because that's a center of power. You have to have a strong waist. You don't want a small waist that can't support the upper structure. At the same time, you don't want a waist with a big bulge. So you do fight the battle of the bulge. This exercise now from the side, I push down, and roll up. I flex down and roll up. Exhale down, inhale up. The last tiger move is the knee bend. Stand with the feet side by side, hold the arms at the side, and flex the muscles of the upper leg, the quadriceps and the hamstrings. 
Move up. Exhale on the way down. Inhale on the way up. Use great tension. Act as if you have a 200 pound weight on your shoulders and you're lifting it up with your legs. The secret is tension. This is not just a knee bend. It's a half knee bend. It's not a deep knee bend, which hyperextends and harms the knee joints. Only a half knee bend, so you don't harm those joints. With tension, come up with tension. Hold when you're up. Come down with tension. Hold for the count of one, 1,000. Come up. Hold. Come down. Pretend there's a weight on your back, on your shoulders. Use tension. Think into those thigh muscles quadriceps, the hamstrings, think to the knee joint, you're going to strengthen that knee joint. In addition to these exercises, the knee bend, to develop the legs, I recommend walking. Walking is one of the best exercises all around. It especially develops the legs, keeps excess fat off the abdomen, develops the chest, the cardiovascular system. So I recommend that you also do a lot of walking. I don't recommend too much running because it's very jarring on the body. But walking combined with these knee bends will work the leg structure and give you a balanced physique. You've just learned in this tape three critical areas of life and self-defense. One, how to build a strong, healthy body and how to keep it strong and healthy throughout your life. Tiger moves will do that. Two, how to defend yourself unarmed using powerful strikes of the hands, elbows, and knees. These are knockout strikes. They're designed to drop someone in his tracks, but they don't come by magic. You have to practice these strikes. You must practice them daily until you learn them, and then throughout life, you must do them at least twice a week, 15 minutes at a time. You must do the entire nine power strikes. You've learned how to handle a knife and a handgun. You should practice with the knife on a once a week basis for maybe 10 minutes. The moves are simple. The handgun requires mirror training and live firing at least once a month for the first year. You should fire once a month 100 rounds at least and do 15 minutes of mirror training at least once a week. Now, after you've trained yourself in handgun combat shooting, it's easy to maintain the point shooting ability. Use the mirror training twice a year for 50 minutes at a session, use the live firing three times a year, 100 to 200 rounds at a session. By following McSweeney's self-defense, you're gonna be able to maintain a strong, healthy body and to protect it throughout your entire lifespan or until you become disabled or fragile and weak. And that can happen to all of us and that's when you need the weapons to protect yourself if the circumstances require it. I'll leave you with one thought. It pertains to nations, it pertains to the individual. First a warrior, or all else is folly.